Hello, welcome back everyone. Live coverage here at VMware Explorer, 13th year with theCUBE here, formerly VMworld. CUBE's been there since 2010 when Paul Maris was the CEO. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE, Dave Vellante on the other set, my co-host Rob Streche, leading our CUBE research team, the collective. Now you're going to see a lot more research coming out of our team, the CUBE, and the data our data lake and our technology. And of course, we're more excited to have our friend on theCUBE, Sanjay Poonin, CEO of Cohesity, uh, formerly VMware, formerly SAP. You were on in the early days, 2010, uh, um, with theCUBE, and great friend, great to see you. Um, Always a pleasure. Super excited to have you on theCUBE. As you know, open invitation anytime in Palo Alto. You're, you're busy running Cohesity, and hot market. Well, How's John, it going? John, it's been great, and congratulations to you and Dave and Rob on your success. Yes, 2010, I was at SAP, and uh, the name was still theCUBE, uh, but I remember having a thoughtful, deliberate conversation. Yeah. And you know what we talked about? The, the SAP workloads, like ERP and so on, running on this cloud platform called AWS. <laughs> that was our first conversation, because <laughs> AWS was starting, and then I remember Andy Jassy doing a little video piece for us, because we put our mobility platform and then in 2011, I think you were at AWS reInvent, uh, and it was the first time my Andy had any external guest uh, at uh, reInvent, yeah. and I was his first guest. So it's been great, and yeah, the great fun at Cohesity, we could talk about that. It's been a year since I took the role. Uh, we have really, um, you know, kind of cementing our brand as the best platform of the next generation of these data security management companies, winning a lot of high profile customers, and as you know, you know, you kind of build one success at a time. Well, before we get into the cohesity story, what's going on there, I do want to just comment on what you just said, because if you think about at that time, in 2011, 2012, 2013, cloud was not obvious. Yeah. But for entrepreneurs and folks in the tech inner circles, yeah, it was obvious, something's happening big here. Kind of like the AI moment now, but like not as big. It was poo-pooed by everybody. I yeah. mean, at that time, I remember EMS, oh, the cloud's a joke. No security in the cloud. I was just talking to Ragu over there earlier, and he's like, oh yeah, I remember uh, people were pissing on security all the time in the cloud. And just how things can change yes. so fast. And you've yes. been involved in so many inflection points, Sanji. I, I got to ask you because, like, you've been on both sides of the conversation. Technology wave, business wave, bubble wave, and managed through that. Effectively, what is your take on generative AI? Because it's a gift for many, if, you, if you're in, if you're a tech company and you've been doing machine learning, old, old AI as I'd call it, three years old, that last year, and, you, and you're in the cloud, this generative AI is a gift. Yes. What do you make of it? You've seen many waves. Yeah, I think it's what, exactly what, as you described. When in 2011, 2012, uh, as I was at SAP, I think some there was some denial of, of you know, how could this company called Amazon actually build a cloud? And of course, the rest is history because what Andy Jassy has done and now Adam's continuing is nothing short of incredible, $85 billion machine. And you know, Azure and Google have followed in their footsteps and doing well too. Uh, we saw a continued wave since that time and prior in modernization of cybersecurity because threats, especially ransomware, we play very much in that wave. But I think generative AI, that third wave is going to be bigger than both of those. I think it'll be bigger than cloud and security because it's going to transform everything we do. Uh, it is the essence of being able to ask um, a computer to summarize the library of information and come back with something that's not digestible. So if you're writing essays and you wanted to summarize, I remember when we all wrote papers in college, we'd go back and pull out every book, and even after the internet came back, we tried to scour everything. This summarization capability, the, the idea of summarizing a large amount of content, which is the heart and soul of Gen of AI, is so transformative of everything. And I've been playing around with ChatGPT and BART. It's amazing what this capability can do. And then finding the application of Gen of AI into enterprise software, like what we're doing now at Cohesity, we'll tell you a little bit what we're doing in Gen of AI. I think this is going to be transformational. So I predict it's going to be bigger than what we've seen in cloud and in yeah. cybersecurity. You asked me if I liked to write before we came on camera, and I'm like, you know, I don't really love it. Um, but what AI does, and Dave Vellante quoted this, Rob, when we were on the SuperCloud event, he said it makes, because mainly the writing is the first use case with ChatGPT, but AI makes a great person exceptional and a good person great. And so like, I find that I'm a great note taker. I like to write, but I just don't 
like to script it up and put it into, into like, because I didn't get in English, I'm a computer science guy, right? So like, you know, writing the perfect novel is not on my bucket list item. But AI can help yeah. me, and so that's the use case for all aspects of foundational models. So cybersecurity, yes. okay, let's simulate an attack. Let's use AI to assist us. Yes. So you're seeing this augmentation extension as the key value. How yeah. does that play in the tech app world? Because I can see the infrastructure, but the workloads are going to be AI workloads. What do they look like? Well, yeah. I mean, that's the question everyone's asking. What does an AI lo workload look like? I think so that you're not AI washing, which is going to happen in any new areas. You're cloud washing, you're sort of cybersecurity washing. I think I've encouraged CEOs of enterprise companies or bigger companies or small companies to really think through use cases that are, are, some are, uh, are, you know, are very you know, compelling. I think Satya Nader put it pretty well. We should think about generative AI as a very good first draft summary of something. Okay, so if you're trying to, say, summarize everything that Leo Tolstoy wrote and give it back to me, not war and peace, but in a half page, one page, it's going to do it better than anybody else. Or summarize all the works of Einstein and come back to me with a summary. So when you look at that summarization capability, about 12 months ago when this started to happen, I began to think that it had some application to cohesity. Because in essence, you should think about a lot of the world's data protection, backup data, secondary data, if it's on our platform, is sort of this tape that's very hard to search. So imagine trying to find that 1980s Michael Jackson song on a highly compressed data. That's what we've done. However, generative AI turns that on its head. Let me tell you how. Um, I went up to Microsoft, spent some time with Satya Nadella, and I've, as you know, I've been friends with them for many years, and asked him, I have an idea here of how I think generative AI and open AI at that time could apply to Cohesity. What are your thoughts? In essence, if we have hundreds of petabytes or exabytes on our platform, highly compressed in our data, could we use OpenAI and, and uh, generative AI to search that large backup of Cohesity data and come back with a summary to a customer of what they had stored in there for years? For example, let's say I'm a CISO of a bank, and 10 years ago, there was a breach at my bank, and the former CISO wrote up a whole bunch of documents about it, but it's in my backup. I want to use generative AI to search my entire backup and come back with a summary of what that CISO wrote. Beautiful use yeah. case. So here I am talking to Satya, he's like, yeah, this is a use case in computer science called Retrieval Augmented Generation, RAG. <laughs> Go back and download all the computer science documents on that and implement it and you're onto it. And I talked later to the AI team at Microsoft, later on to the AI team at Google, and in essence, that's what we've done. We patented that idea because we think we're far ahead of everybody else in data protection at using RAG, Retrieval Augmented Generation, to our industry. We're going to release it in the fall. We're super excited about it. And that application to us is going to be probably the biggest innovation Cohesity has worked out since Moet founded the company. <laughs> it's remarkable. Awesome. So that's how we've got to think. Now, we're also doing some incredible things with AI and security. Ransomware hunting, data entropy, detecting when you do mass restore, when you do more sort of surgical restores. All of those things are AI capabilities that we're building or building into the platform. So uh, AI pervades a lot of what we do. Remember the, the, the roots of Cohesity are a bunch of Google engineers who started. So there's a lot of AI already in it. But this generative AI capability to us, I think, is going to be mind-blowing in yeah. terms of where we could take the company. I, and I would encourage yeah. every CEO to do the same thing. I was going to say, and I, I mean, you guys, I was at AWS when you, you did the deal with them and landing on S3 and being able to back up to and store in uh, Amazon. And I, I think in, when you look at what you're doing through the partnerships that you've built, it's, the data is everywhere. And so how are you looking at it for keeping that data, uh, especially when somebody's like, I, it, you know, backups, I was also, I ran all of the backups and uh, DR for John Hancock Manual Life Financial in North okay. America, long time ago. Uh, <laughs> used to get letters from the SEC, like on a weekly basis, hey, I need this person's email from, with the words market timing in these emails. Okay, now I got to pull. E-discovery. Yeah, yeah, so e-discovery oh, type nightmare. stuff. How do, you, how do you look at it, keeping the AI not only the results, but the data actually separated. Are you doing different models for you or looking to do different models for each customer? Yeah, really good question. Uh, I think the first way to think about it is, I think what happened in the last 10 years, every one of the traditional backup companies that had not modernized to a hyper-converged scale-out architecture um, was sort of left behind in architectural no man's land. And that's what Moet founded. We were the first to take his ideas of Nutanix, hyper-converged, 
to the secondary data space. Everybody else since had copied our architecture. So we were the first, so we have the best product today in an architected, uh, cloud-ready architecture for doing data management. Now, AI adds on top of that the ability to do things like search or ransomware detection and security and so on and so forth, but we believe it has to be done in a responsible way. So if you don't have access or authority to be able to ask that query about what happened 10 years ago, you won't be allowed to do it. And that's what we call responsible AI. So you govern it by role-based access controls, you govern it with appropriate governances. You only are allowed to do it on your data that you backed up, not the world's data. So I don't believe that we're going to be worried about the meaning of life questions, right? I mean, Google's have to answer, like, is the computer sentient? We're not asking, you're asking AI-based questions on your data that you're backed up, right. and you won't be able to ask those questions. We're not allowed to, to do it because of security controls around it, right? So we're trying to govern this with a lot of controls, but even then, you're probably going to have to worry about things that people get wrong. What if this summary that comes back to me isn't accurate? Right? So you're going to have to link to the source documents you found it from. So if someone says, listen, I actually want to make sure that the summary that you found is accurate, you link, here's the actual document I summarized it from, you can read the detail behind it. You'll have a bibliography of where it found these sources from. And I think as we get better, the model will get yeah. better and better at being able to summarize with accuracy. I, I um, asked ChatGPT when it first came out, summarize for me everything Sanjay Poonin's talked about analytics. You remember my first foray at SAP was analytics. And it was, I came back with stuff that was pretty, you know, all over the map. Yeah. I refined the search and it was actually not so bad, the second or third. And I think that's what's going to happen with generative AI in the consumer world. We're going to get more and more tighter about refining what that person has spoken on a particular topic. Uh, I would love to say, hey, summarize what John Furrier has written in his entire or spoken about Andy Jassy because you've been one of the best at being able to interview him <laughs> through his years. Yeah, I got a lot, and of, that summary, got a lot of content on yeah, it. Yeah, I mean, if you could summarize it, that's a good starting point to somebody else who's saying, I'd like to understand everything that Andy Jassy's talked about with John Furrier. If you could ask our Cube AI any question, what would you ask it about you? What does Sanjay Poonin? What's the most controversial thing Sanjay Poonin has said on the Cube <laughs> that got him in trouble? I don't know. <laughs> With his, his PR team afterwards. I don't know. I mean, it's always that something... There's still time left in this. I know. We could go I anywhere you want. Top. I've always I been just, reprimanded by my PR team. <laughs> like, you know, hey, you know, next time could you go easy on that topic? You know, I, you have to spice it up a little bit, but... Uh, See, uh, it came up with a few things. It says accepting criticism is a thing you were big popular on, uh, making a decision during a layoff on someone. And then um, there was an interaction with um, Diraj. Oh, let's talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> that's that is an actual, that's okay. There you go. That's an actual response from our. Diraj and I AI. finally, yeah. after all of that, we're actually. I mean, you know, I, I'm not close friends with him, but we're we're. I wouldn't consider anything. We were competitive, and yeah. when we finally met, we were at an advisory board. We're coming back on a flight. He said, "Let's take a picture and show to the whole world that's awesome. that there isn't this." Anime. Yeah. And my view is, in general, listen. We don't have to be competitively dismissive about all the companies. I think in my younger days, I probably did a lot of things, tweeted a lot of things that were stupid. And I'm willing to admit, like, whatever, seven, eight, ten years older, I'm wiser about those things. I tell our people right now when we compete, you compete with integrity. Yeah. I tell people among our competitors, they are good products, but now I'm going to tell you why I'm 10x better. Right. Okay? But I don't have to dismiss them to talk about why I'm better. Yeah, Anybody who throws FUD out uh, at, at companies and mudslings, they're not going to win long term. People know that you're a good competitor and you are actually in high integrity, so I, I can vouch for you there. Uh, I was just making the comment that we have our own language. We have 38,000 videos all with transcripts. We love it. And that's got a lot of jargon in it. It's a treasure it. trove. So, yeah. you know, you've got to be on many times. So we think that's going to be augmenting our And isn't our your search. son building the AI models now? No, no, he's pursuing <laughs> the reputation. <laughs> oh, okay, got it. But uh, I got some more Fourier's inside the, the, <laughs> the family everywhere that now. are doing all of the things. They're everywhere. That's awesome. Um, really appreciate your time. I want to get a quick uh, sound bite from you on your presence here at VMworld this year. And if you can comment on state of the VMware ecosystem as it goes to transition to Broadcom, because you know the, the obvious trends is the big, bigger booths, a lot more bigger booths, and not a lot of mid-sized booths, and then a lot of little ones, almost like a, the mid-range of the ecosystem has been kind of hollowed out a little bit. Um, so what's your presence here? I know you don't- Listen, I have a fantastic respect. Raghu came and spoke at our virtual conference, did Catalyst Virtual this time. Uh, I met for breakfast with Hawk Tan, I had a lot of respect, largely because Broadcom's a big customer of ours. They're one of our top customers. Uh, Alan Davidson, their CIO, um, you know, they back up a lot of their workloads with us, so we're honored that they're a top semiconductor company. So our view is that as VMware prepares for that, I think now it's a matter of when, not if, it's likely happening, they're getting all the approvals. Uh, I think that yep. you're going to see, as he points out, 
there's going to be the public cloud players and there's going to be the private cloud players. He's positioned very clearly that in the private cloud, VMware customers are in good hands. I believe that's going to be his. And our use case as one of the top, we do VMs, databases, NAS files, and M365 better than anybody else. And our top workload is VMware. The largest customers who run on VMware back up and protect the data with us, Corey, we win them because our scale and speed are second to nobody, right? And then you add security like ransomware protection, threat hunting, cyber vaulting, we're ahead of people there. Now with AI, I think we'll take the next leap. So our mission, because we're much more an enterprise player. A lot of the other players are more mid-market in our, in our competition. So our message to the, the top VMware customers is we're going to come here. We still think, you know, hopefully this conference continues going into next year. We will be a, a presence here. We'll take care of our customers. Uh, whether it's on the show floor or in hotels nearby. I think coming back to Vegas is probably a, a good decision. Uh, you know, I think there was sort of like, you know, also Moscone, I think, was kind of going through its little yeah. bit of, do you want to be there or not? A lot of crime there, yeah. too. Yeah, I mean, I didn't want to go there, but, you know, it's yeah, a tough situation. But yeah. uh, I, I, I wish, listen, I have only love for so many. I mean, I come here and I walk down the show floor. It's just so nice to see people whom I've known for many years, you know, kind of, you know, taking pictures and selfies together again and uh, high-fiving. So I'm, I'm, you know, I feel like I'm forever part of the VMware family. Yeah. And obviously the AI has given everyone a, the, a spirit of uh, youth, youthful energy. I, I know, mean, I Jensen feel was fantastic yeah. this morning, right? Yeah. I mean, he's, I mean, can I just say 30 seconds, the first time I met Jensen, because in 2012, 2013, when I joined the company, we wanted to do a VDI integration with, with uh, NVIDIA, and there were engineers at VMware who were not fully supportive. We got Jensen to come in 2013, I think it was a 2013 conference, he stood up on a table like this, guys with his leather jacket, same leather jacket he's wearing, okay? <laughs> and just spoken, like 100 people gathered around him about the benefits of VDI passed through the GPU. And I was a Jensen convert from that point yeah. in time. He could hold court. And I mean, I was live. like, yeah. he's a friend and mentor, I consider him, and it's so great to see company, when I tracked at the time, it was 20 billion market cap. When it was 200, I said, you're going to be 500, and now he's almost a trillion. Yeah. So very happy for him and that, count, and that, that NVIDIA VMware partnership. Uh, so, you know, they're also a customer. We're going to do more with them. So excited about this time. So great to see you. Good to see you, in too. person. Last minute we have left. Put a quick plug in for what's going on at Cohesity. What's new? Give us some stats. Give it a, get a little commercial out for Yeah, Cohesity. I think, listen, we talked about this. We're getting more and more public ready. The big step is getting cash flow positive, preparing for when you public companies about profitable growth. I've strengthened the, pub, the executive team. I made some announcement of a new CFO who has had great experience taking companies public. Uh, and, you know, we're winning in the market. Our enterprise proposition, our customer base is phenomenal. We had Salesforce uh, talking publicly why they picked us over alternatives. So I'm excited about these new customers coming in. The way we win is we're a multi-cloud story. Okay, VMware is one, but then you've got AWS Azure and others. We are the best at security uh, and AI. Those are the three vectors. Yeah. A multi-cloud data management story, the best at cybersecurity for protection against ransomware, and now generative AI opens it all up. Those are the three vectors. You'll see us as we talk more as a potentially public company one day, and I look forward to the continued dialogue with you guys. Yeah, we're looking forward to seeing more of you. Sanjay, thanks for coming on theCUBE. Really appreciate it. Okay, live coverage here. VMware Explore 2023, theCUBE's 13th year, covering this conference, formerly VMworld. I'll be right back with more. I'm John Furrier. Rob Strecce, live day one coverage. We'll be right back.